Well, good morning, church. Isn't it great to be alive today? I think it's a great day to be alive in. I want to welcome everyone who is able to join us in Sanctuary today, and of course those who are watching online as well. Uh, our condolences go out to Jim and the passing of her uh, sister, Betsy. Um, we know that she is with the Lord today, and likewise with uh, Debbie Bodding and her family. We celebrated Nolan's life on Tuesday last week, and uh, we're just thankful for the, the experience we had with Nolan. Uh, and as we look forward this Saturday to the celebration of life for Larry Metzger, now, there's a difference in the way that service will be handled in that that's going to be an online-only service. So uh, you'll see there's a link coming in your email this week uh, that's going to take you to the special part of the grace page that, that will allow you to participate in his, in his service online. So just know that you'll be getting that email this week telling you how to do that. And we also have a great praise this week. If you've been watching the, the pandemic numbers, it's a little like watching the stock market. You know, it's like it goes up, it goes down. But you look at the overall trends of the things that really are most critical for our overall health and ability to operate as a, as a family of faith uh, the way we traditionally have. And those numbers are looking much better, aren't they? The hospital numbers in San Antonio are much better. The number of cases are down. We're looking at those trends, and we're working on our plans uh, for what it will take for us to be able to add some of the additional things that we've been doing in the past back, not to the way we used to do them, because I don't know how long it's going to take before we get back to, to the way we used to do things, and my guess is we'll always do some things a little differently. That's, just, that's called learning. We learn from our experiences. But we're just blessed that things are looking much better our community appears to be healthier right now. If we stay the course and keep doing the things that, that uh, we've done to get better and to stay safe, my guess is we will continue to be better and be safer. So uh, things have a flow, an ebb and a flow. So let's just be, be thankful for that. Also, for those of you that live in the area, you may notice we're doing some work or, or have some work coming up. We had two major problems with the Sunday school buildings on the side. One is that one of the air conditioners has failed and needs to be replaced. Uh, unfortunately, the parts for that are no longer available for that air conditioning type, so we have to go to a new air conditioner. Um, and in order to get that in, it's going to require some construction on the building itself because of the way the lines are in the building, and it's a lot of stuff you don't want to you don't want to know. It's it's sort of like when somebody says they're having their GI checked. Just say, "Oh, thank you." You don't want to know the details. It's not not helpful to you to know the details. Uh, but the other thing is that we've got a plumbing leak between this building and that building. And unfortunately, the piping that was used in between the two buildings, turns out that years ago they did a recall on that piping because it leaks. And guess what? We're in our second leak. But we are indeed blessed in that both leaks have happened in the prayer garden. So it's just meant extra water in the prayer garden as we kind of deal our way through it. But we know it's the same pipe that goes all the way to the commodes in the sinks in those two buildings. So... Uh, we've got to get that pipe all the way replaced because we could be unfortunate enough one day to find out that our buildings are flooded because the same pipe is leaking inside the building that was leaking outside the building. So we're working on those two uh, major projects, and as soon as we get through with those, we'll be uh, announcing kind of what, what is next for, for us as far as uh, maybe some changes inside the building to make things a little safer for us, a little healthier for us. But uh, right now, your board is working hard on that, so just be thankful to them when you see a board member uh, give them your appreciation for all the hard work they're putting in, especially during this time of pandemic. Let's go to the Lord in prayer to praise Him this morning. Lord Jesus, we are so very thankful that you've blessed us. We could be upset over things like air conditioners that fail and plumbing leaks, or we could decide to, to be thankful that our prayer garden has received extra water and that that's the only place the leaks have been so far. And we choose to be thankful, Lord. We thank you for every opportunity you put before us to, to choose to be a light instead of darkness. So we, we shine the light on that which is positive. So thank you for blessing us so richly with that. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for our community doing better in COVID response and, and the, the health numbers and statistics that are kind of mind-numbing sometime, sometimes. We're just thankful that we have good indicators now that we're on a better path and I just pray that we are continuing to be safe and careful so we don't travel backwards, but instead continue on a forward path and learn from, from the things that we've experienced. Help us, Lord, to, to be appreciative of every gift before us and every opportunity to bless 
one another, Lord. I'm just personally, Lord, I want to thank you for my aunt in, in Indiana who just came off a ventilator this morning and is, is breathing on her own at this very moment. What a blessing that is to us. And Lord, we know there are others in our congregation who are dealing with problems in their family, medical problems. I, I lift them up and ask, Lord, that you help each of us to, to be mindful, to, to ask for prayer for those who are in need, that we might send those emails into the office and that we can get them on the prayer list and help each one who's dealing with, with medical trouble to see you as the ultimate physician. Lord, for all those, those who are ill, for my cousin Vonda as well, that you give her peace as she continues to be on a ventilator this morning. We pray for her family. We pray for her, for her doctors and nurses. We ask, Lord, for your blessing on your church family here at Grace, that we always minister to those around us and never fail to show people what it's like to have true faith in a living God. These blessings we ask extend, Lord, to the gifts that have been offered this morning for the, the operation of your church through general tithes and offerings, and also the gifts that will be given later for the relief fund that can be dropped in the box at the back of the church or mailed in with relief on it. We just ask, Lord, for, for a blessing on them that they be multiplied as only you can, that we might continue the ministry you've called us to. Hear our words of praise today, Lord. Hear our heart and, and know that we love you and we want to serve you with each and every breath you bless us with. This we ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, during our music ministry, Jesus, your love, bring yourself closer to the Lord.
Amen. God's love never changes, and it will sustain us through changing stories and seasons. His word also never changes. We're going to read today from 1 Corinthians 12. This section is uh, subtitled Spiritual Gifts. This is 1 through 11. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one is speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This is the word of the Lord, and we can trust it. Let's be to God. Thank you, Wallace. So how many people do you think we would have had come to church today if we had changed a sign out front that said, This Sunday, free gifts! <laughs> we would have been full, right? Except they would have had to realize that God's gifts are not the same as those gifts that you're promised by, you know, those late night TV commercials. God's gifts actually work. You know, uh, on this Communion Sunday, I wanted us to take a look at how God's gifts uh, come to all who believe in Him, how important a message that is for us. I think it's, it's helpful for us to remember that in the passage today, Paul is writing to the, the church of Corinth. And if you want to know what the church of Corinth was, they were in, this is southern Greece, and Corinth was just known for evil, okay? I mean, there was more bad stuff going on in Corinth than even the worst of the cities you can imagine in the United States. So if you think about the most depraved city in America, don't name it, but that's like Corinth was then. Big trade city, lots going on, but they had a lot of evil going on too. So that's, that's where this letter is, is addressed to those people. And this important city is, is known as a place of drunkenness and debauchery and all that kind of stuff. We get that. And it was so bad that not only was it bad for people who we knew were bad, but it was so bad that people who were known to be involved in the church were also known to be involved in terrible sin. I mean, we're talking about even things like, um, uh, like incest from within the church, and that was just happening all the time there. So, uh, in fact, if somebody was, if you're going to talk about how bad they were, how bad the environment was, you could say they were Corinthianized. It was a Corinthianized experiment. Oh, okay. Well, I can think of a few cities that come to mind. Morally corrupt, Washington. I mean, um, no, that's a different kind of corruption. But it was really a moral corruption that, that was just pervasive in all parts of the society there. So clearly they needed the kind of help that only God could provide. And Paul had already ministered to this community. He had already started a church there in his, second, in his second missionary journey. But they still needed more from him. And that's why, so when you read this passage, it starts off now concerning spiritual gifts. He's going down this list of things about all the things he knew were the wrong with the area. It's sort of like after you, you, leave, you come as a consultant into, into New Braunfels, and I don't know, somewhere in there, the, the consultant might send back a report that says, now concerning those, those potholes you call roads, you know? It's sort of like that. That's what he's saying about the culture of, of, of Corinth. So uh, concerning these spiritual gifts. Now, the, gear, the Greek text here doesn't even use the word gifts. So this is one of those places you've got to look at the original words and understand what they mean. Because I know when I was 12 years old, not yesterday, but when I was 12 years old, I figured a gift either had to be in a box or in a bag with a bow, right? I mean, that's something I wanted that I get that I get to use. 
But that's not at all what the, the term here that was used really was. See, really, the, the Greek reference is to spirituals or pertaining to the spirit. So you could reread that and say, now concerning the things of the spirit, concerning the spiritual things going on in the, in the universe or in your world, that's what he's really talking about. So we shouldn't expect an all-inclusive list that says, okay, here are the seven gifts of the spirit, and, and it, no gift other than, there's no gift other than these seven. It's not going to include all of them, and it's not going to give a full description of all of them. It's more 30,000-foot uh, level kind of discussion is what this is. Now, Paul is cautioning them that we should, each one, them and us now, take time to learn and understand the spiritual qualities or characteristics that exist in life. So understand you can't just go through and decide to live life, check off each day and say, oh, finished Monday, I'm going on to Tuesday. That's not what life is about. If you're in the habit of doing that, you're missing out on God's plan for life. It's supposed to be more than that. And I've got an image to show you what spiritual gifts are. Really, a, a very clear definition is spiritual gifts are divine enablements for ministry. Divine enablements for ministry. You realize how important it is that you understand what a spiritual gift is? It's really important. Criticism is not a spiritual gift. Knowing the best way to do something is not a spiritual gift. Telling somebody they're not good enough is not a spiritual gift. Telling somebody the only right way is is not a spiritual gift. Having the ability to flame somebody online is not a spiritual gift. It's a divine enablement for a specific purpose, for ministry. So if you think somebody is really gifted, but they're not using it according to, to that definition where it's used for ministry, then it's not a spiritual gift, even if it could be. So improperly used, it loses its definition, right? Now, I often talk about false teaching and apostasy because Paul talks about it a lot. It's obviously important to God. And this area of spiritual gifts is one of those areas where people teach incorrect information all the time. Just like it's easy when you look at a music ministry, you can, you can tell the difference between somebody who's worshiping with their music and someone who's performing and being worshiped because of their music. It happens both ways in churches every day. But when someone is really worshiping with their music, yes, they can have their hands up. Yes, they can kneel. They can scream. They can shout. They can twist. Well, they can. All those kind of things, and they can actually stand up afterwards. But, that's, but that, doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean that it is worship or isn't worship. Worship is an, individual, is an individual way that you show God you know he is God and you appreciate that he is God. That can all be a forms of worship. It's many, many faceted. But what's important is where your heart is in it. Likewise, I could really practice sermons every week and I could get up in front of the mirror and I could do recordings, say, no, I'm going to change this word, I'm going to change that word. I've got to get all this presentation exactly right. And the question would be, why are you doing exactly right? How do you know what exactly right is when you're not God and you're supposed to be God's voice? How do you know? Is it the one that feels good? Is it the one that gets the most laughter, the most claps, the most amens, the most response? Or is it the one when, when you know you're preaching right when you get the most money in the plate at the end of the service? You see, believe it or not, all those are metrics that some churches use to measure how good a job the church is doing that particular week or in that particular quarter. What's our attendance like? How much money are we getting in the plate? How many people are responding verbally during the message? And I'll tell you, it feels good when somebody says amen. Now, I know some of you know that my, my uncle, I've got an uncle who was a a preacher up in Indianapolis, and it was a, a black church, and, and you couldn't get three words in without being told you're either preaching, you need to preach, you got to speak it, brother, something. Somebody was, if somebody in the audience wasn't saying something, you weren't doing your job, you weren't letting the Holy Spirit work. There's a part of me that likes that. Because I also know in that very congregation, if you got off track, you'd hear, uh-uh. And that particular church was very biblically literate, and they knew. And if, they, if somebody said, uh-uh, it was an uh-uh. And you were probably going to have to talk to that sister. It was almost always a woman. After the service, and fig it was. It was. It, I, and they were right. I'm not saying there was anything wrong with that. I'm saying that was a good thing. 
Because, you know, we are supposed to all be held accountable for making sure that the word we give is God's word. And if we get something wrong, we've got to be held accountable for that. That's, that's the job of a pastor. You need to be able to accept that you got something wrong if you did. But what's important is that, that is not the measure of a good service, that people are clapping or they're, they're, they're waving or they're throwing things or whatever. It doesn't. That's not how you measure a good service. The question at the end of the service is, was God built up? Was he held up as holy? Were people introduced to the living God of the New Testament? That's what a good service is supposed to do from beginning to end. Do you know more about God? Do you know more about your relationship with God? If you don't, one of two people has a problem. It's either in the person or people here, or it's in the person or people there. It's never God. God's word is not going to change to make us feel better. Did you know there's nothing in the Bible that's changed because we're in a pandemic? Not a single thing. There's not a single verse that God has said, oh, they need a verse about this. No, he doesn't amend it because we're going through a tough time. What he does is shake his head thinking, why do you not recall? I've given you my word. I've told you to, to read my word. So here in the, in the people of Corinth, they'd been given great instruction by Paul. He set up a great church, and then as soon as he leaves, what happens? The reality of the culture works its way into the church, and even in the very church that he had preached the word of God in, even the, as great a preacher as, as Paul was, there was sin in that church, including incest, because they were in the culture more than they were in the word of God. Pretty bad thing, isn't it? And, of course, we have a little bit of an advantage in that we have the Word of God in everybody's hip pocket and everybody's computer and, and most desktops now have them around. I mean, they're just everywhere. You can get the Word of God. That's not a problem. But, you know, somebody can have the great skill and not use it to build the kingdom of God, and it is not really a spiritual gift. If you are a basketball player and you, can, you just can't possibly miss a three-point shot, anywhere you are on the court, you're going to get that three-point shot. Well, that, I think that person's gifted. But it doesn't mean that that is a spiritual gift. But it could be. What if that particular athlete understood that he was gifted by God to use that gift in a way that could honor and glorify? What if he decided instead of, instead of taking political stances, he took spiritual stances? What if he was more worried about the eternal life instead of what you like about the news today or what you don't like about what you were told about the news today? What if? Somebody used the gift, whatever it was, in a way that honored God and built the kingdom of God. Well, then it could be a spiritual gift, couldn't it? As long as God gave it to him. Now, you might wonder, how is it easy or how can you easily tell if something is a real spiritual gift? Because, you know, you get, people use this term spiritual gift all the time. And, and it, some people gives you this idea of, of things that are kind of more ecstasy or they're more mystical experience. And, you know, it's got to involve snakes. It's got to involve a miracle. It's got to involve speaking words that nobody else understands. You know, that it's got to involve one of these, these really mystified weird things, you know, that nobody can get their arms around. If you can get your arms around it, it's not a spiritual gift. That's kind of what some people think. But truly, how do you know you're getting a good deal when you're watching TV at 2 in the morning and you say, hey, I might want to try that? How do you know you're getting a good deal? Well, I can tell you how you know you're not going to get a good deal. When they tell you, but wait! <laughs> if you're one of the next 48 people to call in, then we're going to send you this other item free. All you have to do is pay an extra fee. A free gift that I have to pay an extra fee for. Huh, only in America. <laughs> That's not free. It's not a gift. You bought it. You paid for it. So how do you know when, when oh, 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 and the, the big thing is you bought it, you paid for it, and it's not for your benefit, it's for theirs. That's how you know it's a spiritual gift. Remember the definition. It's, comes, it's divine, it comes from God, and it's got to be used for ministry. And ministry is not to you. God does not give you a gift for your own personal ministry. So if you get the gift and say, boy, I've got the, I have got the gift of, well, when I was a kid, gift of gab. Not anymore. So you've got this gift of gab, boy, you can talk. Well, is that, you know what? That was not a gift, always. Depending on what you use it for, it could be a gift. It could be a spiritual gift. But are you speaking truth with your ability to talk? 
Are you giving people hope with the, your ability to talk? Are you telling them what God really has to say? Or are you just saying, well, I've got people listening, so I'm going to keep on talking? And there are more people in that category than the ones who are really trying to, to get God's word out and give them real hope because God is a God of hope, right? So it's a gimmick if it feeds somebody else or helps somebody else gain. If you're the one who's gaining, that's what we want, right? But if, if, if it's going to gain to the person who's trying to sell it to you, it's not really a gift. It's a gimmick. So spiritual gifts are not for our gain, okay? It's for, it's for us to give to the kingdom. Now, Paul wants us to understand that every person who accepts Jesus as Lord, guess what? They must allow the Holy Spirit to work through them. You absolutely cannot say, I believe you are the Son of God, Jesus, and I love you, I love you, I love you, but here are my conditions. I want you to understand my political view, because if you don't get that right, we can't, we can't deal. God does not deal. He does not deal at all. The idea is God. That's it. Three letters, one vowel right in the middle, God, not us. Now, there's a purpose and an order to the way the Holy Spirit dispenses the gifts, and we need to get our mind around that. And we see that in Romans 12, 4. For as in one body we have mem many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith. And it continues on with other examples. But the key point there is that God is going to give each and every one of us gifts, not one, but many gifts, and we are supposed to appreciate the gifts of others just as we appreciate the, the willingness or have the willingness to use the gifts God has given us for ministry to others. That's what the goal is supposed to be. Now, it's common for us to compare ourselves to other people that we see or we know, which is part of the reason we have such a problem now because we have so, it's so easy to watch others, right? You go on YouTube, you click your computer on on Facebook, and you see somebody else's life. Oh, what a great bass boat, yeah. Well, they show you the day they bought it. They don't show you any of the rest of the maintenance days. You know, They don't show you any of the repair days or any of the rest of it. They're just happy they got it. And then about five years later, you'll see, whoo! got rid of my boat. Those are the two ends of the, of the story of a boat. You know, the first day and the last day are your best days. And, and so when we're looking at, at somebody else's life, we, we compare ourselves. We say, you know, am I taller or am I shorter? And I know that's other churches, not here. You know, am I heavier or am I lighter than that person? Am I stronger or am I weaker? Do we have more hair or less or hair? Do we have hair or no hair? Or is that their natural color? And now I'm not talking about was that their natural color 30 years ago? Is that your natural color now, or is it some derivation of reality for you? But it even happens with our faith, because people will, well, have you ever heard somebody say this? Oh, I wish I could pray like that. What's keeping you from praying? Do you really think that, that God is, is happy because one person has a prayer that sounds really great to, to you? And you're sitting there saying, I just can't pray. Really? The person who loved you enough to send his son to the cross to die for your every sin, he loved you that much, and, and you think he's, he cares about the quality of your speech pattern, your ability to articulate the, the words that you put together. Maybe you, you feel like you're not educated enough for God who created you? Surely not. But we do it all the time. Oh, I can't lead a Bible study because I just can't put things together like that. Well, good. We don't need two like that. We need one like that. We need one like you. We need somebody to, to come forward and say, this is my life experience with Jesus. That's what Bible studies are. That's what small groups are. That's what sharing their faith is all about. It's not about doing it better than so-and-so. Now, it is tough when you're really impressed with somebody else who does a Bible study, for instance, for you to go on that next week and say, well, now... Just forget that so-and-so taught last week because I'm not even in the same category. 
But the truth is you shouldn't be in the same category. God made each of us differently. He gave each of us different experience and each of us different gifts. We should celebrate those gifts. So instead of looking at somebody and saying, well, you know, I really like it when so-and-so sings that song because when so-and-so sings that song, it really speaks to me. Okay, did you know that song was actually for Jesus? (laughs) It wasn't for you. He wanted to hear your heart as you listened to that song and as you sang along with. He's not grading the music team and saying, you know, you, you guys got a nine today. You did pretty good. But boy, the congregation, they were at a ten. Because when the congregation participates in the music ministry and they've got it in their heart and, and they're really participating in worship, that is a ten across the board regardless of what the music team sounds like. That's a pathway to worship for each and every one of us. It can't be the measure of our worship. The measure of our worship is personal between us and God. Each one of us has the ability to do different things. Some people can bake well. Some people can can cook well. Some people can sing well. Some people are very creative for, for tasks for kids and stuff like that. But, you know, that's not the same for all of us. Just like, you know, we compare ourselves to others and we might compare finances and say, well, we don't have as much as they have or they have too much. If I had that much, I'd retire by now. I wouldn't keep working or whatever those judgments are that you put out there. Do you hear the sin that's in each one of those? It's called covetedness. You're coveting what someone else has. It's a lack, of, a lack of being content, saying, I'm not happy with what God has put before me. I want his lot instead of my lot. I want to trade places. No, you don't. God has you right where he wants you. Bloom where he has put you. Be a blessing to those around you where he's placed you. Use the gifts he's given you in the environment he's placed you. He will not give you gifts to use that are not helpful in ministry for those who are around you. He's not going to do that unless he's telling you that you have to practice those gifts for future use. Now, there are two basic categories for spiritual gifts. There are the speaking or verbal gifts. That's the prophecy, knowledge, wisdom, teaching, exhortation. That's kind of what you put the preachers and teachers into. And then you've got the serving gifts, which are leadership, helping, giving, mercy, faith, discernment, all those kinds of things. So basically, you can divide them down into those two just to make it a little, a little simpler. Now, but I've known way too many people who do not understand this basic idea that if the purpose is not to edify the church or glorify God, it is not godly. It is not a spiritual gift if it's not those two things, to edify the church and glorify God. That's the measure. So do you have spiritual gifts? Yes. Are you using them? Answer on your own time. That's the question. But let me just tell you that you do have something to offer. I see way too many people, hear too many people think, well, I don't, ha- I don't have anything to offer the kingdom. I, I can't do ministry. I can show up every now and then, but I can't, like, I'm not in, the, in, in that part of it. I'm glad somebody else will do that, and I'll even write a check for them, but I, I, I just, that's not what I'm here for. I, I can't do that. Now, if I were to ask people in this church, you know, do, what's your spiritual gift? Some people would answer quickly because they know exactly what their spiritual gift is, and I think others would probably just take a blank stare and think, I don't have a spiritual gift. I don't have a gift of mercy. I don't have a gift. I don't like people in my house. I'm not a hospitable person. You have to clean up after them. You have to make something for them and then clean up. And you have to be nice in between. What's up with that? Let me just tell you that at this point in your life, you still, because you're breathing, you still have spiritual gifts that God wants you to use. Because if you didn't, he would have taken you by now. He's not done with you, or you wouldn't be here. I want you to take a look at 1 Corinthians 12, 7, because it gives us that, that word. You just heard it. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It's not for your good. It's not for your pleasure. It's not for your joy. It's not to make your family happy. It's not to make your kids and your grandkids wealthy. It's for the common good. Gosh, that doesn't sound like something we want to talk about in church. The common good? Oh, yes, it is. The common good. Good means that you are supposed to help others to have a closer relationship with God. We all benefit from that. When society pulls itself away from faith, 
we have a problem. When society gets closer to faith, then we do well. It's not hard math. It's simple math. And it's been that way since the very creation of time. Yet we seem to keep trying to pull away. And one of the ways that we do that is we, 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 we fail to look at the simplicity of the language. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each. There's no wiggle room in that, right? To each. Does that mean some don't? No, it means all. All of us. Now, there are going to be different degrees of, of the gift and, and different combinations of the gifts. I mean, I get that. But the question becomes whether, we're, becomes whether we're going to use the gifts that God has given us or are we going to put them on the shelf? Now, when I was mayor of New Braunfels, let me tell you one of the things we had there. We had a wall of studies that were really expensive studies. And people were so happy to finally get that study done on what to do about traffic in downtown New Braunfels. And it was right next to the previous study on what to do about traffic in downtown New Braunfels, which was right next to the study they did before that on what to do with traffic in downtown New Braunfels. Having it on the shelf does nothing. Having a gift that God has given you and not using it for the spiritual gift it was designed to be does nothing for the kingdom of God. In fact, what it does is it becomes a negative ministry. Timothy was guilty of that. You've read about Timothy. He was called to preach and had, you know, had, the, had his hands laid on him, and they said, oh, you're going to be a great preacher. And then, of course, you read in 1 Timothy 4, you know, this is Paul giving him his, his, his boost or trying to. Do not, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Do you hear all that? There's work. The gift comes with a work job description that says, all right, you've been given the gift, now make it into something. Practice it. Hone the skill. It's not going to come just out of the box where you're just instantly a YouTube sensation. You're not going to be what culture now would call an influencer. Not for the good, anyway. What you've got to do is you've got to realize that God will put these things before you and make it possible for you, but you've got to, you've got to practice using the gift. You've got to improve your use of the gift. The gift was not for your benefit, for the ben but for the benefit of others and for the kingdom as a whole. So use it that way. If you're standing in front of the mirror trying to get the perfect way to articulate something because you want to get the, the, the Jesus pitch just right for, your, for your, your sermon at work next week, oh, that's not going to happen. You're going to work yourself into a hole, and you won't be presenting the gospel. You won't be presenting the love of Christ. You're going to try to present the perfection you can bring. Now, I'm not saying you don't practice. You need to practice, but you need to leave room for the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit does, and that is communicate through you as a vessel. You can't tell the Holy Spirit what you're going to do next week. Well, you can, but it's not a good idea. Now, Timothy, with all this encouragement, still gets distracted and still doesn't stay the course at first. And in Paul's second letter to Timothy, in, in chapter 1, 6, he says this, For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. God has given you the gift. Now I'm reminding you, you've got to do some things, fan, blow on it, give lots of oxygen to it. There's the fuels already there. Every got all the components, but let's let this thing really go to something, which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Use those spiritual characteristics, each one he just listed, to get that gift out into, the, into ministry instead of on your shelf. That's where it belongs. So how easy is it for us to think that our time has passed? You know, I used to be able to, maybe I could have one day, but I can't do that anymore. Has anybody here ever thought that? That's for somebody else to do now? That My days are done of that. Huh. What do you think God says about that? The gifts are given to you for the benefit of the kingdom. Did it have an expiration date on it? No, it did not. 
All believers are in the middle of what we think of as a building project, okay? As soon as you become a believer, you are not supposed to be an active part of a building project for the kingdom of God. You're supposed to be building the, the church. You're supposed to be the church in, in reality. So we are the instruments of the building of the body of Christ, known as the church. We're supposed to realize that we are not the ones in charge of this building project. We're not the head of the committee. God was the architect. He is the general contractor. He tells us what to do, and we are supposed to say, yes, sir, here we go. And when God tells you to move that big pile of stone from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill, your answer is not supposed to be, it's too heavy and there are too many. Your answer is supposed to be, I can't wait to see how he pulls this off. <laughs> I'm going to go over there and I'm going to, oh wow, there's a wheelbarrow. Huh, where'd that come from? From God. Maybe it's the invention of the wheel. Maybe it's the pulley, whatever it is, the, the donkeys, whatever. But he will make it possible if he's called you to it. He will never call you to it and not lead you through it. That has never happened in history. If you're obedient to God, he is going to make it possible for you to do it. So we've got to quit telling God how we want to do the project, how we would design the project, and instead say, okay, God, I'm willing. I just don't quite see your plan yet, but I'm going to take the first step. You told me to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take that step. And you tell me where to go from here. You want me to take another step? I'm taking another step. And you just keep doing one step after another until he tells you to stop or turn. And when we do that, then everything works out fine. Now, we've got to remember that we're all on the same team. We can't be criticizing one person because they're not carrying enough stone or somebody else because they're not doing something else we don't like or, or whatever. It's not about that. It's about realizing we're on the same team. We're on Team Jesus, and that's all there is to it. Now, in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14, which continues the, message, the word from today, it says, For just as one body, <clears throat> or just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body through many, though many are one body, so it is with Christ, for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. We are supposed to be that united, absolutely merged together, no separation at all, with a singular purpose, to serve the kingdom of God, to help build the kingdom of God, to glorify God with every gift he's given us. And that's really, when you think about Communion Sunday, isn't that really what we do? We wipe out all the sin from the past. We say, look, God, we come, we're coming to you asking for you to take all the sin away from us. You've promised us you will. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ because we believe in you. And we're asking you, Lord, to send us away from here with a clean slate, ready to serve you in a more powerful way than we ever have before. That's what communion is. We come to his table, and he takes us how we are, and he sends us out that we might be, be vessels for the kingdom that we might be soldiers for him. We've got to be one in Christ. All recipients of, of grace and forgiveness, all giving grace and forgiveness because we've received it. That's why we're called to God's table. So we can fully understand that he's given us these gifts that we might go from these doors out and be his representatives, his ambassadors. That together we can function as one body of Christ. Whether we're in times of crisis or not. You know, this pandemic is not the biggest crisis we have to deal with. The biggest crisis we have to deal with is the crisis of faith. Our inability to look past the challenges of today and see that eternity awaits us. And we're choosing our eternity with every decision we make. Choose God, choose to use the gifts he's given you that others might come to know God by knowing us. Amen? Lord Jesus, we come to you in prayer today on this communion Sunday asking that you help us to feel the release as we give over all the sins that we've committed, the things that we've done wrong, and the things that we failed to do that were right. Lord, for every time we have not been good representatives of the kingdom, we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your guidance that we might do better. We ask for the opportunity, Lord, to, to bring people to you, to know your love, your grace, your mercy, to help others know what it's like to, to, like to live a life of contentment, a life of peace, a life of balance, a life of grace and mercy. 
Lord Jesus, we come to you right now asking for, for a blessing on all those who are sick and, and all those who are helping the sick, the doctors and nurses, all the caregivers. We pray a blessing on them. We pray a blessing, Lord, on, on all the teachers who are about to be with students through as they come back into school, whether it's in person or online, that their, their hearts be encouraged, that they know that we love them and we appreciate them. And we pray, Lord, for their physical safety as they work in these difficult times. But help us, Lord, to not be fearful, but instead see the challenges of today as just an opportunity to show our faith in you, our love for you, our desire to, to be more than, than a product of our circumstances, but to be living, walking, teaching New Testaments. Hear us, Lord, as we, we try to pray to you in a way that is meaningful. And you gave, us, you gave us a perfect example of how to do that in the Lord's Prayer, and, and we're going to come to that, Lord, but just hear our hearts as we, as we pray that we're thankful that you are God. We acknowledge that you are God and we are not. That we, we know that we don't know your will fully, but we want to come to know your will and accept your will, whatever it is. We, we will live with that, Lord, because we know your ways are better than our ways. Lord Jesus, we pray for your kingdom to come to us. So that perfect example you gave us in the Lord's Prayer, we come now as, as a family of believers to, to pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sometimes you just need to breathe. This is one of those times for me. Communion is a very special time because it's our reminder that God called everyone to be to his table. You know, when he called his believers, his followers, his disciples up to the upper room, which is what we're reenacting when we do communion, he didn't look down the list and say, well, now, yeah, you've done good enough, and you've done good enough, and, I mean, he invited Judas, accepted Judas to the table. There is no one beyond redemption with God. So when we're singing this, this final song. I want you to know that God is not looking at you thinking you are unredeemable. He's looking at you thinking, don't you know you've already been redeemed? I've already paid the price. Just accept it and live that way. <laughs> It's never a wrong answer, you know. Well, here we are for Communion Sunday, and some people are at home, and they're not going to be able to receive communion in the church, but we do know that they can receive communion at home. So as I consecrate the elements, anyone that's watching at home, they're welcome to bring their bread and their drink out. You can hit pause. It's okay. Prayers don't have to be at a certain time stamp on your, on your TV. But we'll go ahead and bless those elements here for us, and 
and for those at home, and then we'll locally serve uh, those who are here in the sanctuary in just a moment. So when we serve communion at Grace, there are a couple things that we do. One is we want to make sure everybody knows that we are an open church, which means that if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're welcome to receive communion here at Grace. Also know that if you're an adult or you've been through confirmation, then you come forward. If you're a child and you haven't gone through confirmation yet, just cross your arms in front of your chest and we'll, we'll bless you as I come by. Um, but we won't actually serve communion to those who haven't been through confirmation. So at home, I'm going to ask people to, we're going to go through the blessing, and then you'll be able to serve communion at the end to all those there. And of course, for those who are here, you'll see your board members, some of them participating in communion. So if you're wondering who to ask about the project here or the project there, then look for the people who are helping to serve communion, and that's a, that's a great start. So when Jesus had his, his followers, his disciples come up to the the, la the, the upper room and for this last supper, they didn't know what they were coming up for, but the food was blessed as is always the, the case for Jesus. He never passed an opportunity to thank God, his Father in heaven, for providing the food for them. So he did that and he, he lifted the bread and, and, and blessed it just as he would for any other meal. And he said, this is my body which will be broken for you. Each time that you eat of it, do so in memory of me. Christ's body would be broken for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. And it was in the same way that he took the cup and he lifted it up and he, he blessed it and he thanked God for providing the drink. And, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, the new testament. My blood is, will be poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Each time that you drink of it, do this in memory of me. Christ's blood would be shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. Well, Heavenly Father, we ask for you to bless both this drink and this bread, that they will be for us an everlasting reminder of the sacrifice that you made for us. By dying on the cross, Lord, you paid the price for all the sins that we would ever commit. We accept the gift that you've given us by your very grace and our faith in you, the gift of all eternity, eternal life with you in heaven. We ask a blessing on each and every person who's, who is receiving communion today that they fully understand the significance of receiving the body and the blood of Jesus. This we ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless each of you at home. We're going to stop the live stream and then we'll continue on worship here. Those helping with communion, if you'll go ahead and...